I want to start off by saying that this video is not an attempt to disprove the existence of God, nor to bash on religion or to discredit faith. Rather, I hope that this perspective can help clarify and enhance faith so that it can take its most educated, inclusive, tolerant form. I've read the Bible cover to cover multiple times and have found many instances of ageless wisdom and poetic beauty in its pages. It is, without a doubt, the most significant book in Western civilization. Most of the world's 2.2 billion Christians accept the Bible as the infallible, direct word of God. Yet few of them have read the Bible all the way through, and even fewer know how it came to be. You have to understand that the Bible isn't just a single book that was written from beginning to end. It's not even a single collection of books that were written from beginning to end. Rather, the Bible is a collection of translations of copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of fragments of parchments that were written down by errant human scribes who heard the stories told by somebody else after they were handed down from person to person. So even though the stories may have been based on real characters or events, it's unwise to assume that the final story we have is literal history. Anyone who has played the game Telephone should be keenly aware of just how much word of mouth information can drastically change after just a couple retellings, let alone after centuries of religious and political flux. For example, the first books of the Bible are attributed to Moses, but they weren't actually written by Moses. Outside of the Bible, there is no historical record of Moses at all, nor of a mass Hebrew exodus out of Egypt. In all the detailed Egyptian records we have available from that time or any other, there is no mention of some two million Yahweh-worshipping slaves, Moses, water turning to blood, the death of Egypt's firstborn, a plague of frogs, or anything like it. They can't even find a single Egyptian war chariot in the Red Sea. Furthermore, most of the locations mentioned in the Exodus story, like Pithom, Ramses, and Edom, didn't even exist concurrently during the time Exodus was supposed to have happened because they were built centuries apart. So where did the story come from? Scholars like Drs. Israel Finkelstein and Neil Asher Silberman have demonstrated that the Exodus story didn't exist as a single cohesive narrative until about 5th century BCE when it was used as a theological and political manifesto to unite the Israelites in a then current battle against Egypt. If that's not enough to cast serious skepticism on the idea of Israelites coming out of Egypt, then let's also consider that anytime we see two cultures existing simultaneously in a close geographic proximity, we can see examples of cultural exchange. So if Israel came out of Egypt, we should see some indication or some lingering remnants of Egyptian culture in their architecture, their art, their religion, whatever. And yet, in all the archaeological excavations of the earliest Israelite settlements, we don't see any, any remnant of Egyptian culture. Not in their buildings, not in their pottery, not in their sacred texts, not in their sacred objects. Rather, all of these things bear distinct indications of Canaanite origins. And that's just the Exodus story. Other stories in the Bible are just as problematic. Take, for instance, the flood that allegedly covered the whole earth with water, killing all life except for the animals and humans preserved on Noah's Ark. This story, I hate to break it to you, is historically and scientifically impossible. We literally have records of multiple civilizations, including Egypt, that lived uninterrupted before and after the time was the flood was supposed to have taken place. They couldn't have been entirely submersed in water. If that isn't enough to cast serious doubt on the story, consider the logistical impossibility of Noah collecting some 8.7 million species of animals. How did at least two of every animal in the world get to Mesopotamia and then back again? What about the species of armadillos that can't swim? What about the animals that are so far away and so slow moving that they'd literally die of old age before arriving? What about animals like the koala that have geographic specific diets? What about the marine life that wouldn't survive a fresh or saltwater flood? As Bill Nye reminded biblical literalist Ken Ham, we have remains of, of kangaroos that lived in Australia before and after the flood, what we don't have are remains of kangaroos that traveled to Mesopotamia, that swam across, you know, the ocean and then migrated across land and back. 
that record doesn't exist. Then there's the Ark itself. If it were real, it would be one of the wonders of the world. But unlike other wonders of the world, which took entire cities full of skilled craftsmen and builders with technology developed over time, the Ark was supposedly built by eight lay people with primitive tools whose revolutionary shipbuilding techniques were never seen again afterward. Dismissing the whole thing as a miracle of God is only easy if you don't think about the specific steps that go into building such a monumental project. The more you break down each step, the more you see it can't be just explained away as a miracle. It's simply a logistical impossibility. God may as well have instructed Noah how to build a time machine. A wooden ship that size with no iron hull or nails simply cannot survive long at sea, much less in the most turbulent aquatic conditions the world has ever seen while carrying the most complex and volatile of cargo. As the National Center for Science has demonstrated, just the weight of the animal supplies and clean water alone would have immediately sunk the ark. Now, maybe God harvested all the wood and helped build it himself. Maybe he teleported all the animals on the ship. Maybe he conjured up more water than the world is capable of holding and then made it vanish afterward. Maybe he used his power to keep the ark structurally sound in the most impossible of conditions. Maybe he shrunk down the animals. Maybe he put them in enchanted sleep where they didn't need food, proper environmental conditions, or water. Maybe he teleported them back once it was all over. Or maybe the flood story, just like the Exodus, is a Bronze Age myth that grew more and more grandiose with each retelling. Maybe there was a man named Noah. Maybe his local world was flooded. What we can be certain of is that the story that is contained in the Bible about a global flood and an ark that preserved all life form is simply false. Now, if you're thinking, well, that's the Old Testament full of allegory and parable, Hate to break it to you, the New Testament is not much better. At the very outset of the beloved nativity story, we run into historical issues. In Luke, we read that Caesar Augustus required every person to travel to their ancestral homeland to be taxed. The problem? That never happened. Biblical scholar Dr. Bart Ehrman points out that the reign of Caesar Augustus is actually really well documented, yet there isn't a single reference to this census in any ancient source. Furthermore, the Romans never required people to travel to their ancestral homelands for taxation purposes. Any political or social scientist can tell you what an absurd and unnecessary nightmare this taxation system would be. He also points out that the Bible says the census happened when Quirinius was the governor of Syria in 6 CE. Now King Herod died in 4 BCE. If Jesus was born under the reign of Herod, as it says in the Bible, he could not have been born under the reign of Quirinius because there's a 10-year gap between the two. It seems evident that the writer of Luke finagled the facts to make the birth of Jesus fit into ancient prophecy, but it just didn't happen like that. And notice I said the writer of Luke. Luke himself didn't write a gospel, nor did Matthew or Mark or John. Contrary to popular belief, the gospels are not eyewitness accounts. They are second and third hand accounts written down decades after the facts by Greek speaking Christian scribes, not illiterate Aramaic speaking Jews. How can we trust the gospels contain the actual words of Jesus when they were written so long after the facts by people speaking other languages in other countries? Even if one of the writers by some miracle happened to be there, how well can you trust their memory? Dr. Ehrman asked his grad students if they can recite the last State of the Union address from memory. Can you? Can you recite a State of the Union address from 50 years ago from memory? I don't think so. Another thing to consider is that we don't even have the original manuscripts from the original authors. What we have are copies of copies of copies, each with many contradictions and discrepancies. And I'm not just talking about spelling and punctuation. So much of what we think as core gospel teachings, like the woman taken in adultery, or the signs that follow them that believe, don't appear in the original copies. They were added centuries later by scribes. The available textual evidence indicates that Jesus may never have even claimed to be God at all, as Dr. Ehrman demonstrates in his book, 
how Jesus became God. Biblical scholar John Mill spent 30 years comparing New Testament manuscripts. When he finally produced his version of the Greek New Testament, he cited some 30,000 significant differences in the manuscript. And that significant is important. If you're just looking at discrepancies, there are more errors, contradictions, and discrepancies by way of you know misspelling or punctuation. There are more of those than there are words in the English language. So these 30,000 here he's talking about are ones that are specifically textually significant. So even though the Bible may be historically significant, we can't accept it as historical truth. It's just way too conflicted. And even if it were 100% accurate, it still wouldn't settle any questions of faith since the Bible is subject to each person's individual interpretation. Though, of course, most people believe that they happen to have the only obvious and true interpretation of the Bible and that everybody else is wrong and just needs to conform to them. And yet they don't let the Bible speak for itself. The Bible doesn't claim to be the definitive word of God. Nowhere in its pages is an indication that God or the original writers wanted the stories to be collected into a single book or that this book should be the ultimate authority on objective truth always and forever. That's a narrative which, like the Bible itself, was created long after the facts to serve a specific social purpose. Now, a historical approach to the Bible need not destroy your love of Christianity. If anything, it should strengthen spiritual power by removing illusions and false traditions. Instead of expending spiritual energy trying to fit God into rigid Iron Age myths that condone rape, slavery, genocide, and homophobia, faith can recenter on principles that need no historical context to be relevant, things like non-judgmentalism, kindness, and compassion. I hope a historical view of the Bible can help us check our egocentric and ethnocentric impulses to assume our cultural and personal narratives are 100% right and everyone else's are 100% wrong. Perhaps once we stop portraying the Bible as God's single downward reach toward humanity, we can see it as one of humanity's upward reaches toward God. Perhaps this can help us appreciate the transcendent myths of other cultures. Perhaps we will see in those myths our own sacred stories told through different symbols and realize that we all have a lot to learn from each other's perspectives. Perhaps this will unlock the door to the transformative love and peacemaking power that Christianity is really all about.